Good evening, everybody, and welcome to lecture, well, technically it's lecture two, but uh, for module two, but it is, I guess it is week three? I don't know. So I'm going to call this lecture two for module two. So um, I would like to do a couple of things. First, I want to take care of some housekeeping issues. First of all, I would like to say that if you hear any dog barking, that is because my sister has two corgis and they are very, very loud. Hopefully they won't make any noise, but if they do, my apologies. Um, second, I would like to say you guys did a great job this week with um, getting back into um, or, or really taking the feedback that I gave last week for module one talking points and running with it. You did brilliantly. Um, a lot of you really took the whole question everything to heart and I really appreciate that. So kudos, keep it up, keep up the good work. My goal is to teach you how to question your assumptions. Don't go into something thinking, oh, yep, this is confirming what I know or, you know, et cetera. Really take what the book is saying. Question it. Question your own experience. Is what you experienced really what you experienced? Because a lot of time, a lot of times it can be very different, right? Someone can be ex experience the exact same thing as the next person and have very different um, recollections of it or etc just because of who they are and how they take in information and how they process information so really think about taking the information provided in the book and really applying it layering it over your own experiences so you guys did brilliantly with that you took my suggestions I don't know if you actually took the suggestion because I posted it yesterday but it looks like you took the suggestion, so I'm going to say that you did. <laughs> so um, there's that. So congratulations. Um, there have been some questions about the short essays. They are, there's three assigned. You can submit them literally at any point in the semester. Um, it, you know, only one per week, obviously. So the latest that you can put off doing all three would be like week nine. Um, having to start on week nine. So if you want to start and do all of them at the end of the semester, that's fine. We have some, I have, um, we have a couple of students who are already starting to submit theirs, which is great. So they're getting a good head start. Um, but my, my point is, is that you are all working adults. We're all adults here. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you have to have, you know, they have to be due on whatever. You'll figure it out. So, so that is what I'm, I am most concerned with. Um, there have been some ex some people who have been concerned about um, how to do external research. So I'm going to be posting a poll on the website or on the Moodle page to see how many people would like to set up maybe like um, a Skype chat, all like a group Skype chat chat to go over um, some research suggestions on how or or recommendations or maybe even a little class on how to do external research um, and there also has been some questions about MLA format so um, I'm also going to be posting a, a link to a website that I find very useful but I highly recommend because this is a college course I'm not going to be going over how to write in MLA format so because um, I kind of expect you to be able to do that or at least look up how to do it so uh, if you need some help on direction on how to find that information, I can help you with that. The library does have some services as well. So I think that's all the housekeeping for now. So I'm going to keep this really short and sweet. You guys had great discussions this week. I really enjoyed reading them. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to talk about. Um, I've noticed some common threads Part of the reason why last week or answering every single one, every single one of your threads was pretty tough. Um, so, and especially because I found myself saying kind of the same thing over and over again. So, what I really wanted to do, which is the whole point of the lecture in the first place, unfortunately, technology can get in the way sometimes, um, is to address some of those common threads. So, what I would like to talk about first would be mutuality of concern. Um, I'd like to talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, control, um, Chelsea's point about an article that she read called Better Decisions Through Diversity. I thought it was very interesting. Um, 
the fact that a lot of you really preferred working in homogenous teams and talking about and, and how that um, plays into judging a book by its cover, um, how groups are created uh, based on common threads and similarities. So let's get started. First of all, talking about mutuality of concern. One of the things that I would really like to point out about that is that, and actually we can kind of go right into um, groups that are created based on similarities. Um, a lot of you struggled with the idea that um, if someone's not interested or, it's, or the, the subject of the, the group meeting or whatever is not particularly pertinent to someone, then it getting them to pay attention can be very difficult. So one of the things that I would really like to point out is a thing called buy-in. Um, it's a concept that in my background, um, in international relations, it gets used a lot to talk about um, social development, economic development, uh, development of the rule of law, um, but it really has to do with um, getting all the stakeholders or all of the people who are involved in a, in a project to have a stake, to really feel like they have a part in what, what the process is. So a lot of you were talking about it, but I really wanted to nail it on the head. So buy-in, you can create buy-in, you can um, foster buy-in. So um, I think Kim brought up the point about her working as a teller, Kimberly Burns, I think you brought this up, um, working as a teller and having, you know, having to go to a meeting with, that has to do with mortgages is not really particularly um, pertinent to you. So a good facilitator would explain the reason why it's important to you because and I'm completely making this up because I have no idea, but maybe it would be something along the lines of, um, well, I am, uh, you are the first line of contact between the bank and the, um, the, the client or the customer. So maybe you're the one who needs to know when, um, or, or when someone might be interested in, in a mortgage or what sort of offers the bank has. So when they give you a reason for being involved, that would be creating buy-in. So this is a, a way for a team leader to, like I said, um, increase mutuality of concern. And you can do this in any um, regard. I, I have, I know someone who's a school psychologist and, um, when we were discussing the topic, uh, she said, yeah, I have to do that with parents all the time. I have to do that um, when I go to a meeting to discuss an IEP or um, a learning plan for any student. I have to make sure that I have buy-in from the school, from the teacher, from the parents. And if everybody's not on the same page, you know, people are like, I'm not going to do it. I don't care. Right? So... That is one way to increase levels of um, mutuality of concern. And this kind of plays into my next point, which is talking about um, working on a homogenous team. A lot of you talked about, um, you know, that groups can be groups that are based on common interests and similarities are, are better. Um, and there was a lot of discussion going back and forth about diversity. Is diversity good? Is diversity bad? Are homogenous teams good? Homogenous being very similar, um, heterogeneous being very different, very diverse. And the question that I have for you guys is, can you create similarities? Can you fabricate them? Can you create a, a, a common experience? And if you can, or if you can't, I should say, can you focus on, can you find the things that you do have similar in order to create or foster an environment of mutual concern? Um, and I bring this up because um, someone mentioned icebreakers and someone, I think it was Brian Burns who entered, who brought up icebreakers. And then someone else talked about trust exercises. And that's actually what those are supposed to do. They create a common experience for a team that may not have any background that's common at all. So like when you go to the military, you join the military, you have all of these people from all over the country who have very different backgrounds. But when you bring them together, they have to be a team. 
They have to work as a team. So in order to do that, you create similarities. You create an environment that increases um, that mutual concern. Um, so there are ways to do that and icebreakers, trust exercises, just doing things together creates that, which is what in the, in the first two chapters we talked about, um, uh, the fantasy chain and how that can be a problem sometimes, but, you know, creating, um, those common experiences that, that, that is a positive. So, um, so my question is as well, if you don't have time to do that, is there a way to get around that? I would say yes, but I would be interested to see what your thoughts are. Question me. Like I said, question me. Am I right? Am I wrong? No? I don't know. So, all right. So now that we've talked about that briefly, I would like to talk about, oh, I'd like to reference Chelsea's point about better decisions through di diversity, Her the article that she had. I'm going to actually share that as well. Um, and I have another it's a podcast I would highly recommend. NPR has a podcast called Invisibilia. Excuse me. I would highly recommend that you guys take a look at at least the episode about categories. Um, it's very interesting. It's not necessary. You don't have to do it. I know that everybody has like, you know, crazy work schedules. So I'm not going to throw on extra work that I didn't tell you that I was going to do. Um, but I highly recommend it. It's very interesting. Very interesting. My point about this is that we automatically categorize things. We automatically put people and things into new categories based on our prior experiences. So, you know, we often say, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, but in actuality, judging is uh, as an evolutionary trait that we've developed in order to discern, okay, are, are those berries okay for me to eat? Or is that snake going to bite me? Or is that person from a tribe that's going to kill me? Like, those are things that we, we think about without even really thinking about them. So the, the question is, can you take in that information, recognize that a judgment is being made based on prior experience or you know, your intuition, if you will, your, your evolution, biological evolutionary traits. And can you overcome that? And can you say, okay, well, that's not particularly relevant for me right now. <laughs> I, yes, those berries are safe because I'm buying them from the grocery store. Or yes, that person is okay because, you know, we don't have tribes. And, and I mean, I guess we can have, kind of have tribes, but that's a different question for a different day. But my, my point is, is that you can you look at those, you, uh, acknowledge that you're making those judgments yourself and override the information. So that was one of the things that they talk about in this podcast. Um, I'm going to post this as well on the website or on the Moodle page. So take a look. It's really interesting. Take a look at uh, Chelsea's um, article as well. Very interesting stuff. Um, uh, all right. So the next thing I want to talk about, and the last thing I think I want to talk about is, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the thing about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that it's, it's a model. So uh, a model has to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. I don't have a problem with it in general, um, but I do have a problem with the fact that um, oftentimes we think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs as being something that is progressive. Um, so, you know, it, once you make one step, you can't advance, you can only advance each level until you've met the needs of the first level making it kind of static, meaning it doesn't change and very um, delineated, meaning that there's, you know, very clear boundaries between one set of needs and another set of needs. And, and I would assert, and you can, you know, come back at me, tell me that you think I'm wrong, but give me some reasons why you think I'm wrong if you do, um, that it's a little bit more dynamic than that. So, for example, things change. Things are constantly in flux. So, for example, um, as an uh, Iraq War veteran, um, and we do have some Iraq War vets in this course, um, when 
when I was downrange and dealing with um, Iraqis or interacting with Iraqis, um, what I found was that a lot of times uh, they were very concentrating, uh, concentrated on their immediate needs, which makes sense because if you don't have enough food to feed your family, that's a concern. Um, but interestingly enough, a lot of times when they were also focusing on, on their immediate needs, they also at the same time were concerned about things like education. Education is not necessarily an immediate need, but it was definitely something that was on the forefront of their mind a lot. Um, when will I be able to get my kids to school? When will the school be reopened and will it be safe? And you see how they're like with that question, that, that last question, it was a conjunction and will it be safe? So a lot of times your needs are at the same time. So thinking about it in a way that um, it's, my, my point is that it's not always so static. It changes, it moves. So I prefer if the, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I prefer to think of it more as a, a bunch of circles that kind of overlap. And, you know, there are things that we all have to think about. Having said that, there is truth to be said for, um, a lot of times people can't think about long-term needs unless they have those immediate needs. Uh, so for example, I, and I go back to international relations because that's where my background is. Um, in international relations, we talk about the issue of simultaneity, which means, you know, what are we doing? What can we do at the same time, right? So a lot of times, like you look at Afghanistan, when we went to Afghanistan, um, we were trying to create democracy and bring democracy to Afghanistan when um, there's no roads <laughs> and there's no security. There's, you know, no secure f source of food and water um, or heat. So having people want to vote when they can't do those things, like getting rule of law into a society that really doesn't have enough food can be a problem. So there is definitely something to be said for Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I just encourage you, as my colleagues in learning, to really think about it in a way that it is um, question it. That's my thing, question it. Um, specifically though, think about how, how is it that it can be dynamic? How is it that our needs are dynamic, that they don't change, or that they, that they change very often, and sometimes multiple times in one day? And how can that impact how you communicate with members of a team? Um, so I think that's it. That's all I have for now. And I really look forward to seeing what you guys have next week. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm getting your short essays in now, and I'm really excited about those. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet. I'm sorry. But I will get them to you as soon as possible. Um, um, like I said, just to recap for me, because this is how I think, um, these are the things that I'm going to be posting within the next couple of days. Uh, a doodle poll or a Google poll on how to... or how many of you are would be interested in doing a, a Skype class lesson on um, research skills and touching on how to do an MLA or at least find the resources to do use MLA format for citations. Um, I will be posting the link to the Invisibilia broadcast or podcast because it's really good. I also would like to plug Serial because it's really good. Um, just personally, I thought it was really interesting. Um, and I said I would be posting uh, for everybody to see in the announcements um, Chelsea's article. And I think that's it. All right. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, oh, the lecture activity is open. So please complete that, hopefully within the next couple hours. Um, it's really short, really brief. It's just a, a self-assessment, a skills, uh, listening skills self, self-assessment. I'm hoping what I would like to do and what I have set up right now is that we will revisit that, um, at the end of the semester and see if it's changed at all for you. So, all right, I think that's it. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks.